<laughs> Dude, if I start <laughs> shrinking before your very eye, <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> let me know. We need like a signal, you know, maybe you can make the <laughs> the crib sign, flash the crib sign, the bloods. Jen, Jen was uh, Alice in Wonderland. In, I know. Uh, the last one. I know. Yes. I want you all to know that I know now. <laughs> it was like that meme, how it started how it's going <laughs> it was funny because i noticed you were like kind of shrinking down but i didn't really think oh. anything of it and then when you texted afterwards i was like yeah you yeah. kind of were getting <laughs> almost out of frame your face uh. was still there but well by the end i was just like this floating head and props to matt for not being like <laughs> excuse me ma'am i can't answer that question honestly how can i take you seriously i mean really Steven. Hey guys, how are you? Hello. Good, how are you? Good, good. To Beer Net Radio, I would like to welcome Steven Gavula III, founder of to uh, Costa Tequila. And Costa Tequila is a high-low tequila, I believe the first high-low tequila, named for blending 100% blue Weber agave, sourced from two traditionally separate regions in Jalisco. Um, but it caught our eye because you guys are doing something a little bit different. You're going in some markets with some really big beer wholesalers. I think last year you guys announced that you're given the brand to Henley in Arizona and you've recently announced that you're going in parts of New York with uh, Sheehan Family Company. So so two very big beer wholesalers, but we'll get into that and a lot of other things. So thank you for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Sweet. So first, you know, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into tequila. I mean, do you come from the industry? Where did the idea come from? All of that. Yeah, it's, it, it's a great question. Uh, it, it really was a true passion project. So my uh, my heritage, my background is a bit in the hospitality business. So my great grandfather was actually in the beer business. My grandfather was in the hotel business. And then my father was in the restaurant business. And of course, uh, myself, I went into the corporate business, the corporate <laughs> world. So I did uh, about 16 years in the corporate world, um, focused away, but I guess something was in the blood. So <laughs> The idea was, um, you know, I had done a, I had been looking at, at trying to do things a little bit different in a number of different industries. Um, and I enjoyed kind of the hospitality business, the spirit side of things. I had looked a lot at that, that business, but I never really thought of it as something that uh, I would run or own a company at that point. So I, um, I had gone on a trip to Jalisco, Mexico, and that was back in 2016. And this was your typical bourbon trail, but doing it in tequila. So mm -hmm. heading down there, visiting a number of distilleries, talking about the product. And I found out that there was this deep love and affection towards tequila. Uh, the, the country and the people involved, it was just so infectious that I spent about two and a half years down there um, kind of researching, learning more about the product. Uh, I was going obviously back and forth between the US and, and Mexico, but I had found a small distilling family that was willing to do a little bit of something different with tequila. And I thought that uh, at the time, this was 2016, so tequila was 4% of the US spirits market. I think now it's roughly 21, 22%. I'm not sure where Discus puts it now, but there's been this, you know, the last eight years has been an extreme kind of move in the agave space. I'm sure you guys have seen it. There's a lot of new brands on the market as well. And, uh, but at the time there was, you know, your your typical larger brands, your Jose Cuervos, Patrones, Casamigos was there as well, but they were predominantly from one region or another. So uh, if you've been to Jalisco, Mexico, it's the, the distance between a mountain region and a valley region is is quite far. And uh, a lot of the distilleries reside in, in one or the other areas. But what was happening was that the agave that was grown in those regions, similar to wine, uh, have different tasting notes. So Highlands tequilas tend to be a bit more uh, floral, sweeter. Um, some people say smoother to drink. And then Lowlands tequilas tend to be a bit more peppery and herbaceous um, and silky in texture, kind of as the, as the ending feel to those. And the Lowlands tequilas are your Jose Cuervos, Heredoras, your Highlands tequilas are Casamigos and Patrones. And I had done a bit of research uh, on kind of the spirits industry and scotch was always very interesting to me because it was always single barrel focus for a long period of time early on. And now everybody talks about scotch blending. And um, I think the real 
issue with that tequila had back in that time, 2016, 17, was that it was the consumer wasn't truly educated yet on kind of where it was coming from and how it was made. And so my thought process had been, and this was before even kind of creating a business model, was rather could I create a liquid that had tasting notes from both regions so that when I told people about the product, it would teach them a little bit more about the intricacies of tequila. And I think that's where it kind of was fostered from. I truly love tequilas that were in the Highlands, but I also love those that were in the Lowlands. At the time, Highlands tequilas, as I said, your Casamigos and Patrons were, were hot and were obviously doing, doing great things in the market at that time. I think Casamigos buyout had maybe just been done or mm -hmm. was, was about close to being done. Um, so for me, it was, could I, could I incorporate those uh, tasting notes from both regions? And uh, luckily enough, over the two, two and a half year plan or span, excuse me, we were able to create an infrastructure that allowed us to source agave from the highlands and lowlands of Mexico and bring them to our distillery. Our distillery sits about 20, 25 minutes outside of Tequila, Mexico. So there's a town of Tequila. Um, and, and so we had to be able to truck the agave from the highlands, particularly, which is quite a distance away to our tequila distillery, to our distillery, which is in the lowlands. So the idea was, could we create that infrastructure, which took a period of time? Uh, could we create a liquid that made some sense? And then for me, it was at the time, could I share it with friends and family and see if people cared about it? And then uh, this was 2019. We started entering it into some competitions. We started winning some awards. And then at that point, it was, could we actually compete with some of the, uh, the large brands that are on the market that have loads and loads of money? And we did not have that at the time. And so we decided to do a, a proof of concept. Uh, I was living in New York City at the time. And so we did a proof of concept in October of 2019. Uh, nothing better than starting a brand in OND, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was a great way to kind of figure out if this high-low concept would actually translate amongst consumers, retailers, and the like. And so we, we ended up getting about 65 different placements from October to January, which was a bit shocking to us. We had kind of a, a feet on the ground tactic, hand selling, which, um, you know, I'm sure young brands do all over the place. So we had done that. Uh, we got picked up by one of the larger uh, spirits wholesalers, and that was in January of 2020. Is it Glaciers the, or Southern Glaciers or RNDC? So it was R R &DC. Oh, okay. So R and D C had picked us up, but they had picked us up, which I, I didn't really want to build the business in New York. I knew how challenging, time consuming, mm -hmm. and capital intensive it was. We wanted to actually build the business where my my hometown is or I grew up in the uh, in the mid Atlantic, so northern Virginia. And mm -hmm. so we wanted to kind of develop it around there where we had some connections. Uh, so they picked us up actually DC, Maryland, and Georgia. And Georgia was an interesting one because we had some contacts down there as well. And then, of course, March 2020, uh, COVID hits and mm -hmm. throws everything uh, for a loop. And my wife is actually from the Florida, uh, the east coast of Florida. So I had moved at the time I had a young kid. I've got two children now. But at the time I had a young kid who wasn't in school. So we took the risk and moved to Florida. And uh, it was in Florida that I was started to to get introduced to the beer networks. And uh, the first uh, beer network we got introduced to was Anheuser-Busch. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was a distributor on the East Coast here, uh, I'm actually here right now. And uh, they had said that there was an opportunity to potentially be sold through their wholesaler, uh, which is just a territory of Florida, but that some of the beer wholesalers, particularly in the AB network, were going to be getting involved in spirits. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've obviously seen that over the last uh, at last eight years, and it's not just necessarily spirits. It's not alk. Uh, mm -hmm. It's different. It's energy drinks. It's different different types of things. So, uh, for us, the I guess there was a risk and reward there. The reward has has greatly outpaced the risk at this point, which has been fantastic. Um, and our you know the the struggle we had with a larger beer wholesaler, or excuse me, a larger spirits wholesaler, was getting from you know, kind of that starting point to phase one. And mm -hmm. I think that's always the hardest things for brands. If, if you don't have an exceedingly large amount of money in the beginning, or at least in the, in the tequila space, uh, it is, it's hard to get noticed in a portfolio where there's a lot of different tequilas. Mm -hmm. And so we found that we were getting uh, some good focus from the, the beer wholesalers. 
And over the last four years, we've pretty much expanded in 13 states, excuse me, 14 states uh, as of uh, about a month ago with uh, 45 different beer wholesalers. So oh. I think that the, um, the traction has been great. The expansion has been really good. It's, it's gone everywhere from Hensley in Arizona, as you say, to, uh, to some of the guys, Claire Rose on, on Long Island, all the way down to having all the Florida guys as well guys and girls. So I think the, um, the idea there is, is we are committed to partnering with people who want to help us grow. Um, I think that the partnership is a true, you know, the three tier system in this industry, as you guys know, can be challenging at times. And so having partners at, at one or the other levels is, is really fortunate or has been fortunate for us and important. So that's kind of where we're at, we're at right now. I think that the business has grown. We we were 87% year over year growth last year, which is great. Um, our trailing 12 months put us roughly around 23,000 cases. Our goal this year is probably closer to 35 or 40,000 cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that we're looking to necessarily expand markets at this point. I think we've got a great set of, of wholesalers in 14 markets, and we're hoping to dive deeper into the ones that, that we have currently. Right, so. right, right. That's kind of the uh, the passion project turned into a business mentality, or at least, uh, uh, yeah, business. So I don't right. it, the cool. the true true American dream to some degree, I guess. Yeah, yeah, the, the <clears throat> yes, uh, on both sides of the border, right? <laughs> of course, of course, exactly, exactly. Uh, quick follow up, you know, I what I'm hearing you say is that one of the things you like about uh, beer wholesalers is that they're really good brand builders, especially for young products, right? Do you think that you know you guys will stick with them when when the product maybe gets a little bit bigger, or or is it like a, a brand life cycle thing, or are you it's not great, even thinking about that right now? No, it's a great question. I, I you know we don't think about it too much. I think that we have some great partners at this time to grow mm -hmm. to that next level. I don't think that uh, there's there's a reason to move at this point. Um, and like I said, the partnership for us is number one. I think that what we've learned is that the education piece, not only for the consumer, but also for the wholesaler has been important. So it's probably taken us a little bit longer to get to where we want to be uh, as a brand, even though we're growing at a, at a great rate, uh, only because I think that they're, you know, the beer wholesalers, the consumers, everybody is kind of coming up the curve at the same point of part in time or point in time. So for us, it's uh, it's been educating kind of both on this high low concept about tequila, uh, about our four SKUs at this point, we just released uh, a Costa Tequila Cafe, which is a, a coffee infused uh, tequila coffee liqueur, which is a, a great product that's been getting a lot of publicity recently. So, um, yeah, I, you know, we are in this for the long game. We're not in this for the three or four years and try and sell out. So uh, the partnerships are more important for us or were more important for us in the beginning and are still more important for us now. Um we talked in the past about, you know, going an easy route with wine and spirits and it would be like instant national coverage overnight. Um, do you think that's still the case or is that kind of reserved for like almost celebrity back brands now? It's a great question. I, I do think it's backed for a lot of brands that either have some firepower behind them, whether it becomes a marketing tactic or capital. And so I think for newer brands that come onto the market, it becomes a bit challenging. Um, obviously, having a great story, a great liquid is important. Um, but I, I don't think anybody necessarily gets into this business that doesn't have some capital behind them, whether it's a personal investment or, or some sort of capital raise at some point. But in tequila space, particularly, these larger wholesalers, spirits wholesalers particularly, have looked favorably upon the celebrity endorsed brands. I think that they view that as a way to your point, getting national coverage, getting basically zero to 60 in a very you know, short period of time. Uh, so somebody like ourselves who is, and I can give you guys a little bit of background on kind of our marketing strategy, but it's away from that. It's away from the celebrity endorsed brands. You know, we've taken a, an approach in kind of the micro influencer territory where Yeti Coolers had a great one where they bring passionate, interesting people into their business and they kind of seed them with a bunch of product, whether it be their coolers or hats, but they they speak about it within their local communities. And um, 
you know, we've built a platform with our PR team and our social and, you know, our product capabilities to be able to allow kind of people that are passionate about their, their interests, their, their careers, whatever it might be to, to get a platform here to kind of expand that. And so we first looked at the active lifestyle space. So we brought in a world longboard surfing champion, a Red Bull athlete. We've got a band that we just signed in Texas called Uncle Lucius, who were, was on a, uh, a show called Yellowstone, if you guys know that one. Um, <laughs> and so the, uh, we've got a roster of people that we kind of might not be household names nationally, but kind of help us get up the curve kind of locally in their communities, which has been a, a great opportunity. And on the flip side, we're able to help them um, with some some hopefully brand recognition on their side, what they're doing, bring their career to to a bit of a spotlight. So that's kind of been our for, approach. We've stayed away from the celebrity endorsement. Um, but again, it, for us, it's a bit about building over a period of time rather than that uh, that quick one shot from, from zero to 60. Um, and then, you know, beer distributors have been leaning into spirits more and more. Um, as you've partnered with um, more and more beer distributors, have you found that there is still a lot of education on the spirit side of things? Or are you kind of surprised at where they're already at with the spirits portfolio and what they know about, you know, that whole entire category? I think it can range. I think it definitely is. We're in kind of this inflection point right now where there is a lot of wholesalers that are starting to look, but there's also ones that have been in um, the spirits game for for years. So I think it's it's a bit of both. And we're, you know, because we're predominantly with the AB network, we kind of understand their system. We understand kind of how the organization looks, um, kind of the the reporting systems, the ordering processes that they use. So we can kind of take what some of the more uh, advanced wholesalers have done and kind of help guide some of the ones that uh, that are younger in the process. Um, I would say that for tequila particularly, and this is away from obviously the other sectors, there is probably a bit more education. I think tequila is just a newer concept for in spirits in general for for either the consumer for the consumer and the wholesaler at this point. So it's taken a little bit longer for us. Um, to, to get, get them, you know, under, understanding tequila, but um, it is finally paying off. I, I, I say to our team all the time, which is a small team in, in nonetheless, but I say to our time that 2024 is going to be our big year. I think that this year is the one where we've built the foundation. We have a great network of wholesalers. Everybody kind of understands the products and what it should do in the market. And now it's kind of put the pedal to the metal. Oh, cool. You know, you mentioned you're mostly with the AB network where you're with beer wholesalers. I'm curious, did you have any prior connection to the AB network or AB? Because I know you said someone in your family worked in beer, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. That was a little bit during the prohibition time. So that was a little oh. long. That was a long time. <laughs> My great grandfather, a long time ago. But the um, I did not. So so it was a personal connection to one of the AB wholesalers here in, in <laughs> Florida, but it wasn't something from the past, um, okay. which... So I think, you know, it, it, it came to life uh, in kind of a two, three year span where there was a few things that were happening. I think beer uh, had been stabilizing uh, for a period of time. And so I think that there was some interest in looking at alternatives, like I mentioned, non-alc and spirits. So we kind of got in uh, front of them, I guess, at, a, at an opportunistic time. Right, right, right. No, that makes sense. Well, and so to your point, you know, I was talking with a, a big wholesaler. I think they're actually an, a Molson Coors wholesaler last year. And they said, you know, we do want to get into spirits a lot more. And he said, the problem is, you know, of course, choosing which spirit. And then he he brought up the example of tequila. He's like, there's so many tequilas, you know, and you you talked about the tasting notes, the regional, the terroir, that sort of thing plays in tequila, but it can also be like wine insofar as there's a lot of brands and how do you choose, right? And so that was his conundrum. Like, I don't know what's hot. I don't know what's going to keep being hot. So what advice would you give to wholesalers who are looking to maybe bring on a tequila besides Costa, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> there's some things they can look for, you know, that, that well, buys I, quality. I, sure. I, I think the one thing that I would mention about tequila is that that rate of growth that I mentioned from the time I started to the time to, to now has been extreme. So whereas you might see some other spirit segments like a bourbon or a vodka that aren't growing necessarily as fast, this one is is completely taken off over the last year. And that is really, really focused domestically. So internationally, tequila is just a very, they're in inning number one. 
uh, mm-hmm. internationally. And so I think from a from a brand standpoint, uh, there might be an ability for these wholesalers to get on the ground with a few different brands or a brand like Costa uh, that is growing and can be more of a national name in the next two, three, four years. Um, and again, I think that there is a long game here for us. So I, I will say that you know our partnerships, we want to last for, for a period of time versus having something quick. But you know, Molson Coors, interestingly enough, it, it, I think it, it's it's obviously public now, but they had just bought uh, Blue Run Spirits, so there is uh, there's some interest in in that from that arm, and the, and they're getting involved into spirits. So I think, you know, as you dive into tequila, um, there might be some concentration or or at least a flush of some brands over the next uh, two to three years. I think that there's a as you said a lot of them. Um, and they might not be getting the time of day that they they probably deserve. And so inevitably that becomes very difficult for a business. So I would, you know, my advice to them would be keep looking at the space. I don't think it's going away. I only think that it's growing and there's going to be a few that kind of stick out over a period of time. Um, and yeah, don't, don't jump into ones that are just coming to market. That would be my, my suggestion. Right, right. And aren't uh, parts of the segment are flattening out, right? Even though some parts of tequila are still growing, you know, spirits in general outside of RTD spirits are tending to flatten out, which, you know, we on the beer side, we're typically on the beer side. We're like, haha, now you know what it feels like. Sure. <laughs> but anyway, you know, how can you what what are the segments doing and which are the segments that are still hot? So I think there's an interesting thing that's happening with premiumization and particularly I'll speak to tequila, which, which might have happened in, in bourbon a bit where um, when people are consumers, I believe that don't have an idea of where something comes from initially, they normally go or are attracted to the most expensive part of that, right? So the bottle that costs the most is probably the best. Sometimes how I pick wine, unfortunately, which is, uh, you know, not, not great for the wallet, but um, <laughs> I think what, you know, part of that is is in tequila. Now people are recognizing a bit more of where the product comes from, how it's made, uh, who's behind it, and and uh, with that becomes an ability to potentially trade down. Um, and we've made a focus to be accessible for customers. We do not want to sell a product that's a hundred dollars or even eighty five dollars in a store. Our idea, you know, you walk into a store, our Blanco on the shelf is $36.99 or $37.99. Our Reposado is low 40s and our Añejo is probably, you know, low 50s, mid 50s, somewhere around there. And then the cafe is a, a little bit lower than the Blanco. But, you know, trying to, the consumer I feel like is, so So I think that the higher end tequilas are, are likely probably going to stabilize a bit more over a period of time. There's obviously going to be brands that do great and grow uh, exponentially, but I think that's more catered because of the the category than anything else. Um, but the the craft premium spot, I think, is a, is a good place to be. Um, and so you'll find people trading down into kind of that price point. And then obviously it's it's an eco- economy standpoint. Um, you know, my background is in economics, so I kind of look at that stuff a little bit. And so the uh, the the idea here that that it's tough uh, these days, and every dollar doesn't go as far as it as it once did. People are are spending less money on on kind of higher end products if they can, um, just by knowing stuff that's that's of similar quality and and a cheaper price point. So uh, I can't necessarily speak for a bourbon or a vodka sector. Um, I don't necessarily know, uh, you know, the the growth potential there. I, I do have friends that are in the space and their brands have done very well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there there's obviously there's areas that are growing for sure. For sure. Well, that's all I had. Anything else from you, Jay? Yeah, I wanted to just touch real quickly, kind of going back to the origin. Um, you know, when you had the idea of doing this high low concept, had anybody done it before? And you know, what was the reaction? from your team or locals when you brought that idea? And have you seen anybody else replicate uh, what you're doing now? Yeah, so I think there's there's definitely, we've definitely seen people replicate it. And so I think that, you know, our my thought process in the beginning of this was to bring a category to market similar to a Cabernet or a Merlot, where you have a number of different brands, but you're actually focused on performing something or creating a recipe that's a bit different than what was on the market. At the time, there was nothing that was intentionally doing it. So 2016, there was nobody out there that was intentionally taking agave from the highlands and the lowlands and blending it together and creating a flavor profile that was separate. 
I think there was, you know, a lot of the agave fields in Mexico are grown or excuse me, are owned by uh, a lot of generational families. And so you as a brand or as somebody who is trying to create a tequila, you are kind of um, you're forced to look at those different fields depending on where they are. So, for instance, you came to market and the only agave you could get was from the highlands. You technically created tequila from the highlands. Uh, you went to the lowlands. You technically created tequila from the lowlands. We went on a mission and basically started buying up fields in the highlands and the lowlands with our distillery to be able to make sure that we could source agave from those regions. And at the time, there really wasn't anybody that was doing it. Um, again, I think there was a geographical issue with um you know, being the highlands to the lowlands was a distance. So if you had a lowlands distillery, trucking agave from the highlands was just inefficient at the time. Um, we have seen more people start doing a, or create a blended concept uh, that is on the market now. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily, there's no official moniker that we're a trailblazer, but I think the idea here <laughs> is I like being the first one to kind of talk about it rather than yeah. the last. Um, and so, we made sure that that was kind of our hallmark. We wanted to, we didn't know of anybody that was doing it at the time. And so being able to come out and talk about intentionally blending these two areas was, uh, was important to us. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a, a good sign and, um, you know, to, to be differentiated in something like tequila where it's, it's hard, I think, for people to understand differentiation other than price point or celebrity backing. So it's uh, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's there's a world of opportunity. I think in tequila still, and I say world because, as I mentioned, the international market is is uh, is very interesting to us. We continue to get some calls um, from from different parts of the world these days, which is great. We're focused on our wholesalers. I want to reiterate to them if they're listening. We're focused <laughs> on our wholesalers here. They're listening <laughs> and our markets. Yes, I'm sure they are. Um, and we're focused on really creating a business here. So. Um, that, that is, I, I do expect us to have some, some pretty monumental growth this year in 24. Awesome. Well, we'll be watching and, uh, Thanks, I guys. can't wait. Yeah, I, I did. You guys sent a couple of those bottles, which by the way, are really cool, especially when you put them next to each other, they have like a, a little bit of a deco vibe and, uh, For yeah, sure. so, so, but I will, I will break into them very soon. They'll still be pretty, even when they're half drunk. So <laughs> I appreciate I'd love, it, Steven. I love for you guys to try them. Yeah, I think that the brand just in general had a, has a more contemporary feel to it. I, I, you know, walking through stores, I was, I was thrown off by how many ornate bottles there were, and um, you know, fancy labels. And I think just being simple and minimalist for us was an interesting approach that's uh, that stood out. Right. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, we'll check in. We'll check in with you uh, a couple months down the road and see Please how do. 2024 shook up. So we appreciate it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank awesome. you. Cheers. Yeah.